Chapter 13. The Brain. A Broadcasting and Receiving Station for Thought. The Twelfth Step Toward Riches. More than 20 years ago, the author working in conjunction with the late Dr. Alexander Graham Bell and Dr. Elmer R. Gates observed that every human brain is both a broadcasting and receiving station for the vibration of thought. Through the medium of the ether, in a fashion similar to that employed by the radio broadcasting principle, every human brain is capable of picking up vibrations of thought which are being released by other brains. In connection with the statement in the preceding paragraph, compare and consider the description of the creative imagination as outlined in the chapter on imagination. The creative imagination is the receiving set of the brain which receives thoughts released by the brains of others. It is the agency of communication between one's conscious or reasoning mind and the four sources from which one may receive thought stimuli. When stimulated or stepped up to a high rate of vibration, the mind becomes more receptive to the vibration of thought which reaches it through the ether from outside sources. This stepping up process takes place through the positive emotions or the negative emotions. Through the emotions, the vibrations of thought may be increased. Vibrations of an exceedingly high rate are the only vibrations picked up and carried by the ether from one brain to another. Thought is energy traveling at an exceedingly high rate of vibration. Thought, which has been modified or stepped up by any of the major emotions, vibrates at a much higher rate than ordinary thought, and it is this type of thought which passes from one brain to another through the broadcasting machinery of the human brain. The emotion of sex stands at the head of the list of human emotions, as far as intensity and driving force are concerned. The brain, which has been stimulated by the emotion of sex, vibrates at a much more rapid rate than it does when that emotion is quiescent or absent. The result of sex transmutation is the increase of the rate of vibration of thoughts to such a pitch that the creative imagination becomes highly receptive to ideas which it picks up from the ether. On the other hand, when the brain is vibrating at a rapid rate, it not only attracts thoughts and ideas released by other brains through the medium of the ether, but it gives to one's own thoughts that feeling which is essential before those thoughts will be picked up and acted upon by one's subconscious mind. Thus you will see that the broadcasting principle is the factor through which you mix feeling or emotion with your thoughts and pass them on to your subconscious mind. The subconscious mind is the sending station of the brain through which vibrations of thought are broadcast. The creative imagination is the receiving set through which the vibrations of thought are picked up from the ether. Along with the important factors of the subconscious mind and the faculty of the creative imagination, which constitute the sending and receiving sets of your mental broadcasting machinery, consider how the principle of auto-suggestion, which is the medium by which you may put into operation your broadcasting station. Through the instructions described in the chapter on auto-suggestion, you are definitely informed of the method by which desire may be transmuted into its monetary equivalent. Operation of your mental broadcasting station is a comparatively simple procedure. You have but three principles to bear in mind and to apply when you wish to use your broadcasting station, the subconscious mind, creative imagination, and auto-suggestion. The stimuli through which you put these three principles into action has been described the procedure begins with desire. The greatest forces are intangible. The Depression brought the world to the very borderline of understanding of the forces which are intangible and unseen. Through the ages which have passed, man has depended too much upon his physical senses and has limited his knowledge to physical things which he could see, touch, weigh, and measure. We are now entering the most marvelous of all ages, an age which will teach us something of the intangible forces of the world about us. Perhaps we shall learn, as we pass through this age, that the other self is more powerful than the physical self we see when we look into a mirror. Sometimes men speak lightly of the intangibles, the things which they cannot perceive through any of their five senses, and when we hear them, it should remind us that all of us are controlled by forces which are unseen and intangible. The whole of mankind has not the power to cope with nor to control the intangible force wrapped up in the rolling waves of the oceans. Man has not the capacity to understand the intangible force of gravity which keeps this little earth suspended in mid-air and keeps man from falling from it, much less the power to control that force. 
Man is entirely subservient to the intangible force which comes with a thunderstorm, and he is just as helpless in the presence of the intangible force of electricity. Nay, he does not even know what electricity is, where it comes from, or what is its purpose. Nor is this by any means the end of man's ignorance in connection with things unseen and intangible. He does not understand the intangible force and intelligence wrapped up in the soil of the earth, the force which provides him with every morsel of food he eats, every article of clothing he wears, every dollar he carries in his pockets. The Dramatic Story of the Brain Last but not least, man, with all of his boasted culture and education, understands little or nothing of the intangible force, the greatest of all the intangibles, of thought. He knows but little concerning the physical brain and its vast network of intricate machinery through which the power of thought is translated into its material equivalent, but he is now entering an age which shall yield enlightenment on the subject. Already men of science have begun to turn their attention to the study of this stupendous thing called a brain, and while they are still in the kindergarten stage of their studies, they have uncovered enough knowledge to know that the central switchboard of the human brain, the number of lines which connect the brain cells with one another, equal the figure one, followed by fifteen million ciphers. The figure is so stupendous, said Dr. C. Judson Herrick of the University of Chicago, that astronomical figures dealing with hundreds of millions of light years become insignificant by comparison. It has been determined that there are from 10 billion to 14 billion nerve cells in the human cerebral cortex, and we know that these are arranged in definite patterns. These arrangements are not haphazard. They are orderly. Recently developed materials of electrophysiology draw off action currents from very precisely located cells or fibers with microelectrodes, amplify them with radio tubes, and record potential differences to a millionth of a volt. It is inconceivable that such a network of intricate machinery should be in existence for the sole purpose of carrying on the physical functions incidental to growth and maintenance of the physical body. Is it not likely that the same system, which gives billions of brain cells the media for communication one with another, provides also the means of communication with other intangible forces? After this book had been written, just before the manuscript went to the publisher, there appeared in the New York Times an editorial showing that at least one great university and one intelligent investigator in the field of mental phenomena are carrying on an organized research through which conclusions have been reached that parallel many of those described in this and the following chapter. The editorial briefly analyzed the work carried on by Dr. Rhine and his associates at Duke University. Vis-a-vis, -vis, what is telepathy? Quoting the editorial now, a month ago we cited on this page some of the remarkable results achieved by Professor Rhine and his associates in Duke University from more than a hundred thousand tests to determine the existence of telepathy and clairvoyance. These results were summarized in the first two articles in Harper's Magazine. In the second, which has now appeared, the author E. H. Wright attempts to summarize what has been learned or what it seems reasonable to infer regarding the exact nature of these extrasensory modes of perception. The actual existence of telepathy and clairvoyance now seems to some scientists enormously probable as the result of Ryan's experiments. Various participants were asked to name as many cards in a special pack as they could, without looking at them and without other sensory access to them. About a score of men and women were discovered who could regularly name so many of the cards correctly that there was not one chance in many a million million of their having done their feats by luck or accident. But how did they do them? These powers, assuming that they exist, do not seem to be sensory. There is no known organ for them. The experiments work just as well at distances of several hundred miles as they did in the same room. These facts also dispose, in Mr. Wright's opinion, of the attempt to explain telepathy or clairvoyance through any physical theory of radiation. All known forms of radiant energy decline inversely as the square of the distance traversed. Telepathy and clairvoyance do not but they do vary through physical causes as our other mental powers do. Contrary to widespread opinion, they do not improve when the participant is asleep or half asleep, but on the contrary, when he is most wide awake and alert. 
Ryan discovered that a narcotic will invariably lower a participant's score while a stimulant will always send it higher. The most reliable performer apparently cannot make a good score unless he tries to do his best. One conclusion that Wright draws with some confidence is that telepathy and clairvoyance are really one and the same gift. That is, the faculty that sees a card face down on the table seems to be exactly the same one that reads a thought residing only in another mind. There are several grounds for believing this. So far, for example, the two gifts have been found in every person who enjoys either of them. In every one so far, the two have been of equal vigor, almost exactly. Screens, walls, distances have no effect at all on either. Wright advances from his conclusion to express what he puts forward as no more than the mere hunch that other extrasensory experiences, prophetic dreams, premonitions of disaster, and the like may also prove to be part of the same faculty. The reader is not asked to accept any of these conclusions unless he finds it necessary, but the evidence that Ryan has piled up must remain impressive. In view of Dr. Ryan's announcement in connection with the conditions under which the mind responds to what he terms extrasensory modes of perception, I now feel privileged to add to his testimony by stating that my associates and I have discovered what we believe to be the ideal conditions under which the mind can be stimulated so that the sixth sense described in the next chapter can be made to function in a practical way. The conditions to which I refer consist of a close working alliance between myself and two members of my staff. Through experimentation and practice, we have discovered how to stimulate our minds by applying the principle used in connection with the invisible counselors described in the next chapter, so that we can, by a process of blending our three minds into one, find the solution to a great variety of personal problems which are submitted by my clients. The procedure is very simple. We sit down at a conference table, clearly state the nature of the problem we have under consideration, then begin discussing it. Each contributes whatever thoughts that may occur. The strange thing about this method of mind stimulation is that it places each participant in communication with unknown sources of knowledge definitely outside his own experience. If you understand the principle described in the chapter on Mastermind, you of course recognize the round table procedure here described as being a practical application of the Mastermind. This method of mind stimulation, through harmonious discussion of definite subjects between three people, illustrates the simplest and most practical use of the Mastermind. By adapting and following a similar plan, any student of this philosophy may come into possession of the famous Carnegie formula briefly described in the introduction. If it means nothing to you at all by this time, mark this page and read it again after you have finished the last chapter. The depression was a blessing in disguise. It reduced the whole world to a new starting point that gives everyone a new opportunity.